Hello, my name is John Cool, and I'm with the Congressional Youth Leadership Council. We have 22 of our students here today for a conversation with two former members of Congress. Our conversation will center on what it's like to be a newly elected representative and transitioning from campaign mode to governing. This is the second in a series of webcasts that are part of the Civics Connection, a joint project by the Lou Fry Institute for Government and the University of Central Florida and the U.S. Association of Former Members of Congress. These webcasts are made possible via a grant from the U.S. Department of Education and are meant to enable high school students to learn more about their government by asking questions of former legislators. We are joined by former Representative Jay Rhodes, who represented Arizona as a Republican, and by former Representative Toby Moffitt, who represented Connecticut as a Democrat. Let me give each of them the chance to quickly introduce themselves, and then we'll open the floor for questions. Why don't we start with Mr. Rhodes? Well, you've just introduced me. Um, my name is Jay Rhodes, and I um, served three terms in the U.S. House of Representatives representing uh, Central Arizona, uh, mostly the Phoenix area. And uh, since then, I've been engaged in uh, representing Western water and energy uh, clients uh, who have interests in, in Washington. Mr. Malvin? I, I was one of the, probably one of the first Democrats to actually uh, term limit myself because I, I really felt that the Founding Fathers wanted people to uh, be part of this legislature and then go do something else, uh, not to make a lifetime uh, job out of it. So I said I wouldn't serve more than five terms in the House. I served four terms and then I ran for the Senate and I lost, narrowly. And uh, I look at that as something of a blessing because I went on to do a number of other things. Uh, you can call my career uh, brilliantly varied or schizophrenic because I've, I was a news anchor uh, in addition to being a member of Congress, an anchor and a producer uh, for NBC. And I was uh, also a, a business guy in the Fortune 100 company, a vice president globally. Um, and uh, I now run my own uh, company and um, uh, I'm a father of six children and three grandchildren. So it's, it's uh, not bad. All right, we're going to divide up today into three topics. The first is going to be about you've just become elected to Congress. Now, how are you going to put your staffs together? Um, we're going to go ahead and take our, our first question. Good afternoon. My name is Sebastián Negrón from San Juan, Puerto Rico. What values and characteristics do you take into consideration when hiring congressional staff? Well, first of all, that is possibly the most important thing that a newly elected member of either the House or the Senate can do, is to hire staff. What characteristics do you take into account? Um, I think everybody has his or her own rules. Uh, mine were hire people who have experience in uh, the business of the House of Representatives, uh, who, who know where the buttons are that you need to push. Don't hire somebody from your campaign staff in Arizona. And I was very fortunate. Um, I had some assistance in, um, in hiring uh, the, the three top persons on my staff. And generally speaking, titles change, but generally speaking, the three most important members of, 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 of a congressman's staff are his chief of staff, uh, his executive assistant, and his legislative director. Members of the House are very limited. They only have 18 members of staff. And they can be spread out between the district and Washington as the member sees fit, but it's only 18. So uh, those are people who work hard and work long hours and cover a lot of ground and they can make or break you. When Jay says 18, I know some of you probably think, wow, I wish I had 18 staff members working mm -hmm. for me. It sounds like a lot, doesn't it? But you're representing five or 600,000 people. And here's the interesting thing. If you're in business and your business gets really good, what do you do? You can hire more people, right? In the Congress, 
if you're the kind of congressman or congresswoman that goes out and really in, is very visible and people feel like they can then be in touch with you and they can call you and they can show up at your town hall meetings and you're very accessible and then you get more questions and more requests for help for social security checks that didn't come or Medicare or whatever, all the things when you go home that people need help with, you can't hire more people. You may have three times more questions that your staff has to answer uh, than your predecessor who was very invisible uh, but you can't do anything about it. So there's huge pressure on the staff. And do me a favor, when you go to the Hill, try to take a look at the offices because some people think they're opulent and there's all this office space. These staffers are crammed in there. Uh, it depends, though, um, where you came from and what your own background is. I'll give you an example. I'm not going to mention their names. Two freshmen elected in 08. One was a former Hill staffer, worked on a major committee, knew a lot of people in Washington. When that, when that new member of Congress had to hire a chief of staff, it wasn't so important to have a chief of staff with 20 years experience on Capitol Hill because this particular person had the experience. Second person, a freshman who's never really been on Capitol Hill, who came out of a, a different background, uh, was, not a, was not a political person. It's essential to get somebody who knows how the House works. Uh, somebody with experience. So it really depends on, on who you are. Also depends on how much did you win by. If you won by one or two points and you know you've got to go back out of the campaign trail really fast because you're up for re-election in two years, it de tends to determine the kinds of people you hire in terms of who has a really good political you know, uh, antenna. And finally, I always wanted staff people who were smarter than me. I remember the first thing that I thought when I would interview somebody is, are they smarter than me? Not more experienced, but they need to be smarter, and, th and they're going to do more of the work in terms of thinking, because I'm not going to have a chance really to do that, because life is so crazy in that fast lane of, of politics. Thank you. All right, we'll take our next question. Hi, my name is Brittany Vias. I'm from San Gabriel, California. And my question is, when hiring staff, do you try to hire people from different fields other than politics and economics, or do you look into like education and medical and the arts and such, things like that? You take that. Okay. Yeah. I think that you'll find us in complete agreement, although, or even though we've never discussed this. You, you, it's easy to underestimate because Congress has such a low approval rating in the public, and oh, those politicians, and oh, Washington's a cesspool, and all that. It's hard, it's easy to underestimate how smart people are on Capitol Hill. Okay? There, there are a couple things I want to say about that. One, I am always, I, I said to Tom Harkin, who's, we have a couple Iowa people here, when Tom was in the House, and we were young freshmen, and we came out of our offices one night. It was very late. We had had late votes. It was 11 o'clock at night. We were going up the street to have a beer, and there was the Capitol Dome and the beautiful sight. You've seen it at night, probably. And we looked at each other, and, and we said, if you don't get goosebumps when you see that, it's time to go home. And I'm 65, and I still get goosebumps when I see that Capitol lit up like that. And so, you know, people up there, right-wing Republicans, left-wing Democrats, and in between, most of them get up in the morning, they want to do the right thing. Most of them get up in the morning, they want to be uh, sensitive to their uh, constituencies. Uh, political realities do come in. Uh, I remember once uh, uh, some party chieftains in a town in Connecticut saying they would support me the first time I ran, but that I would have to hire a person and put a district office in their town and in exchange for their supporting me at a party convention. And I said, well, who do you have in mind? And they named the woman they had in mind, who was a local Democrat. And I didn't say it to them, but I knew her, and I knew I wanted to hire her anyway, so I made the deal, <laughs> okay? And, and, you know, that was a political trade I made, but I didn't really give up any principles when I did it. So there are, you know, those kinds of things and compromises that you have to make. What would you have done if you couldn't stand her? I, I don't know. If I couldn't stand her, I wouldn't have hired her. No, it's a good question, though. <laughs> That's... You, you, a lot of it is, is, is judgment, and mostly the judgment falls on the shoulders of the member. Um, and uh, you really kind of go by your guts a lot. Adaptability is something that, that a staff person has to have in spades. They have to be adaptable. They have to be able to move quickly and to make quick 
decisions or quick recommendations as to the decision that you have to make. And secondly, and this you can't find out in advance, but loyalty is is it's a key. If if a staff person is not prepared to be 100% loyal to the member, then that staff person doesn't belong there. And I'm sure that Toby's hired Republicans and I've hired Democrats, but the sine qua non was that person worked for Toby Moffat or that person worked for Jay Rhodes. And if they couldn't do it, then they wouldn't get hired. There's something I, w I would like to throw out on the table and ask your view on. One of the things that shocked me and continues to now impress me about the Hill, and especially the House, is that if you're reasonably bright and you're hardworking and you're interested in public issues at a very young age, you can walk in there and if you're good, you can move up so fast as a staffer. It is upwardly mobile if you are good you can go from ledge correspondent, you know, answering uh, emails to legislative assistant handling really critical issues for that member to legislative director running the whole legislative program to chief of staff to maybe a director of a committee. I mean, it's a really wonderful thing that the Hill is populated by very bright, not, not necessarily Rhodes Scholars, but very bright, mostly young people who move up very quickly when they're, when they're good. That's exactly right. And not just very bright, but highly motivated. And if, if their motivation is self, if their motivation is, I want to progress, that's mm -hmm. fine. So long as their progression is, um, is helping Toby or me do our jobs. Quick yes or no answer with that. Do you think as these high school students are thinking about college majors that they should have to major in political science? or, or didn't I, that I was matter? a political science major in, a, in, in undergrad and political science major in graduate school, and I would not recommend it. I couldn't agree with you more. It has next to nothing, I'm sorry to my professors if any of them see this, it has next to nothing to do with what I was able to accomplish. And if anything, I yearned as I got more into uh, political office and beyond for why didn't I take more technical, you know, business, economics, economics science, business. whatever. And, and don't, don't come to the conclusion that the only way to get ahead in Washington is to have a law degree. I'm a lawyer, um, and it, it didn't do me a hoot's worth of good um, being a congressman. And, it, and I hired some lawyers, and I didn't hire some lawyers. Um, I, would, I would agree totally that you should, you should educate yourself in things that really, really matter to the country, to the people in the country, and political science isn't one of them, and frankly, a law degree is not one of them. Economics is, is key. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, business acumen is a key. Some science is definitely a key. Um, there, but there is no one clear path. But the no members like, like Rush path. Holt of New Jersey uh, is a scientist, right? When he starts examining climate change, he's in, a, he's in another area from most of the members. In terms of Bob Walker, who was uh, one of your colleagues yes. on the Republican side, science background, you yes. know? It's mm -hmm. a big difference, really is. We're going to move on to our next topic, which is now that you've become elected, um, how do you start building relationships with other members of Congress and the executive branch mm -hmm. and private interest groups? So why don't we take our, our first question on the next topic? Hi, uh, my name is Anastasia Golovashkina from Naperville, Illinois, and my question is, um, I understand that being a successful congressman, like you guys, uh, requires extensive networking. What advice can you give high school students in the area of networking? and just um, promoting ourselves to maximize our opportunities? I would say, w all right, I'll, I'll give you a broad answer to begin with. Um, tolerance. Being able to understand that 
the person that you are arguing with has a point of view that's different from your point of view, but may have some validity, and that it deserves your attention. And it deserves you uh, paying attention, and it deserves that person with whom you are arguing to pay attention to you. And that's a very, very difficult thing in a highly charged political atmosphere. And in the highly charged political atmosphere that we live in today, it's almost impossible. And I don't think we have enough time to get into uh, the fact that uh, back in the time when the two of us were in the House, some of our best friends were members of the other party. We spent time with them. We spent time in Washington. We spent time getting to know each other. That doesn't happen today. Um, but you wanted to know how to net, what, what's the basis of a network, of networking, is learning to understand that the person that you don't agree with has a valid point of view. Do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think in terms of your question about now, right now in your life, what do you do? Uh, I'm not going to be presumptuous enough to think that all of you are, uh, you know, highly ideological driven and, you know, um, in my case, I can only speak to my own case, the fact that I was part of an anti-war movement, I'm a liberal Democrat, so I was part of an anti-war movement, I was part of the women's movement, I was part of the environmental movement, and that got me, at, at your age, and that got me into circles where I was sort of over my head, in a way, in terms of understanding, but I was networking, I was, I was learning, uh, I was meeting other people, and the most important thing was learning about coalition building, which then goes to a point that Jay made where you're in coalitions with people who aren't necessarily, you know, totally in agreement with you. But that's what coalitions are, are made up of. So I would say, you know, take the big plunge. I mean, the one advantage you have at your age, you can make lots of mistakes, okay? You can, you can apply to the wrong college and make up for it. You can fail a course and make up for it. You can, when you get out, take a job that's the wrong one and quit. I mean, you know, at our age, we can't make too many mistakes, okay? But you're at an age where you, you need to take risks. That's what I'm saying. Take risks, expose yourself to things that don't feel necessarily that comfortable, and get into networks and, you know, different people different from yourself and learn about how to work and build coalitions. If you're going to go out on a bridge, don't write it down mm -hmm. because it'll come back to haunt you. Mm -hmm. All right, why don't we take our next question? Hi, I'm Sarah Garland. I'm from Wilmington, Delaware. And I was wondering, generally were the relationships you valued most during your time in Congress with people that had opposing point of views or people that agreed with you and praised your opinions? Cool. I, I was very young when I arrived and I had, I had my, you know, my, my sort of stereotypes, my attitudes about what I was going to find. I already said one of the things that surprised me, most people got up in the morning wanting to do the right thing, Republicans, Democrats, okay? Uh, the smartness, the brilliance of, of the people, the staffers, uh, was a, really a surprise to me. But also, uh, I had certain opinions about conservatives, because I'm, again, you know, I came out of a movement. I, I, I hadn't been in office before. And I got in there, and I don't know why, oh, I know why in this case, I played basketball in the, in the House Members' Gym. And as we know, there's no dividing line down there. You're playing on a team or you have a Republican on your team and you're playing against a Democrat over here. It's, it's that sort of merging of all the interests without any regard to party. And there's no discussion of issues. I started going to the prayer group. There was a weekly prayer group. I was one of the few Northerners that went to the prayer group. Why did I go? Somebody invited me and they said, we, each week we want a member to tell their life story. So will you be the speaker? And I was like, oh, I was nervous. <laughs> I went in, there were all these Southern conservatives there. I started going every week, why? I started to realize that I was building friendships and, and bridges. And I always advise, because I work in campaigns now, not for money, but as a volunteer for people I, I like, right, and support. And when they get elected, when they're fortunate enough, I always say, go find those bridges. If you don't play basketball, do something. Go to the prayer group, go to this group. And, you know, there was a, uh, Jay alluded to the relationships aren't what they used to be. And the reason is, I guess it's something we'll get to here, these members are running home. Every single time the gavel goes down and the house is in recess, they run home to run around and campaign. Didn't used to be like that. They would stay some weekends, 
have dinner with somebody from a different party, et cetera, a different part of the country, and build those friendships. You don't have that now. I don't know how to uh, expand on, on what Toby has, has just said. Um, clearly, we come from totally different backgrounds. Um, clearly, while well, Toby was, was out uh, burning his bra against the Vietnam War, I was in Vietnam fighting the war. Um, so if, if we met, if, if we had served at the same time, which we did not, and if we met on the first day of the first session, we probably would have circled each other and sniffed our tails and been, you know, dogs trying to figure out what's going to happen here. But if you spend time with people that you respect and you don't necessarily agree with, you change. He may not change. But I change, and to me, that's that's positive. To me, that's 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 good. That's one of the best parts of the experience that I had. Was I changed? I don't know if I changed anybody else, but I changed. It may shock you too that there, there was another Rhodes Republican who <laughs> who became a very good friend of mine. So I don't know if you were aware of that. I. Am I familiar with him? <laughs> My father was in the house for 30 years before I, before I came He was in. a great guy, yeah. All right, thank you. We're going to take the first question from the, the last topic, which is about balancing your personal yeah. life with all the demands of being a member of Congress. Mm -hmm. Good afternoon. My name is Gabriel Lopez Somano from San Juan, Puerto Rico. And my question is, since you must be busy men, how do you manage or balance family time with the time you work? Do you spend at work? Very carefully. And um, that's, that's, really, that's really not, not as flippant an answer as it sounded. Um, you have to be prepared to sacrifice some family time for the work, and you have to be prepared to sacrifice some of the work for the family. Um, Toby was fortunate in that his congressional district is relatively close to Washington. Mine is 3,000 miles away. Um, the concept of taking off every weekend and going, getting on an airplane for six hours and flying to Arizona to do campaign work all weekend conflicted totally with with my ability to to deal with my family so I moved them here mm. um, that is getting to be more and more rare uh, fewer and fewer members move their families to Washington and that is a net loss mm -hmm. for the institution because if the families aren't here the members not going to be here and if the members not going to be here then the members aren't going to interact with each other and everybody loses but it but your question is a very very good one and and it's something that 435 members of the house of representatives have to juggle every day mm -hmm. the senators are different because they've got the six year term but we are constantly running for re-election, and it's a very hard thing to do, and everybody has a different answer. There is no pat answer to that question. What does that juggling look like? Like, how often are you home versus how often in Washington? Yeah, well, I'll, just, I'll get, say something about that in a second, but if any of you suddenly woke up tomorrow morning and your father or mother were a member of the House, believe me, even though you might have your friendships back home and at your schools and so forth, you would really want to be here. I mean, you would want to experience this. You would want to be part of this. It'd be part of your education. That's the political science course that you don't need to pay for, okay? But that doesn't happen anymore. Uh, I have an ongoing campaign of my own with my friends, recently elected Democrats, and they sit in my backyard over here, not far from here, and I make dinner, and we have these arguments where I say, you really should move your families here. This is ridiculous. Your life is crazy. You're not really being with your children. 
uh, they're not really getting to experience what you're doing here. And I might have a little bit of a difference of opinion with you because I, I make a joke. We can, we can be really candid with you, right, because we're not running for anything. But I make a joke when people say, do you miss... Uh, r r being in the Congress and representing your district, I said, oh, if I could go back, I'd want to be the congressman from Guam. And of course, the joke <laughs> is... <laughs> the you joke can't is get there from they, here. Yeah, they wouldn't expect <laughs> to see me that much, right? And so the flip side of what Jay's saying is everybody in the northwest corner of Connecticut, and I loved representing them, and I loved the, the, the area, but everybody knew I was an hour away by airplane. So not only would they expect to see on weekends, I'd get calls saying, if you really support us in this town, you'll come to this spaghetti dinner Wednesday night. And so, you know, the expectation, if you're closer, I mean, Chris Van Holland is right here in Montgomery County, Maryland. Jim Moran is just across the river in Virginia. I mean, they have no place to hide. The, the expectation is that they'll be at everything all the time because they're local. So, you know, that's a, that's a, a, a mixed bag. If you're close enough by plane that they know they can expect you, uh, it's much harder to resist going home every single weekend. A lot of the Westerners, I, I, maybe you weren't one of them, but a lot of the Westerners whose seats get secure because they're winning by 60% or 65% or 70, they do take some weekends here. They do, they're more likely to move their families here. Now remember, tabloid news, blogosphere, et cetera, they attack that, right? As they say, oh, he's now become a Washington inside the Beltway person, or she has. They've lost touch with us. So, you know, politically it's, is tricky to do that. All right, take the next question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Jane from New York, and I have a follow-up question. Many students have to balance schoolwork with a job, just as you had to balance two major things. What advice do you give to these students? Well, I mean, I think you guys are, you know, special. I mean, everybody who's come here with the, under this, uh, this program, you've got, you obviously did something to get here. You didn't just show up. So I think you've already started it, how to balance things and how to prioritize and what's important and what's not. I have great admiration for people such as possibly you or others in the audience who do balance uh, schoolwork with a job. Um, I think that, first of all, it's definitely a learning experience. Secondly, it may be something that is, that is absolutely essential to you and your family, but it shows a degree of responsibility and a degree of willingness to uh, take on diff difficult challenges um, and, and to make a success out of both of them. And I admire you. And uh, I, think, I think your question was, how would I advise a student to balance a job and, and school? I would say that if you are doing that, you've already figured it out. And everybody's got to do it differently. Everybody's got to got their own um, set of circumstances that they have to live with. We've got but about a minute left, so why don't we take one more quick question. I'm Whitney White from California, and I was just wondering if your family supported what you did in Congress, and how did that affect your job? Did my family support what I did in terms of what, how I voted, or in terms of being there? Being there. Yes, they supported me wholeheartedly. My, uh, my mother and father were uh, born in Lebanon. Um, not Lebanon, New Hampshire, Lebanon, the country. <laughs> so they were immigrants. They were part of the Lebanese immigrant community. My father was a caretaker on a big estate uh, owned by a, a very rich German family. So I grew up in the servants' quarters. Uh, when I ran for office from that very same turf, my mother, who worked in a little courthouse, was probably my biggest ally because she knew everybody all these lawyers and other people who came through that courthouse and she was able to start making phone calls and she had never done a political thing in her life. Uh, my father was probably my second best resource because after he left the estate he became a beer salesman and he called on all these different bars and so he knew he knew everybody as well and I suddenly you know woke up one morning and said I have the two biggest you know resources uh, you know, my opponent can't possibly, you know, beat me on this. So, 
And I was a big underdog. I mean, the first poll, I was uh, in a Democratic primary, I was like 83 to 3, you know. So, uh, yeah, they were very supportive and they were extremely proud. And to bring your parents, um, you know, into that chamber when, when you put your hand up or your children, which I've also done, um, is a pretty good thing. Thank you. Okay. One of the proudest pictures I have hanging on some wall is me standing on the floor, getting sworn in and standing beside my father and with all four of my sons standing beside there me. You go. Yep. A, a moment that you just can't replicate. That's right. Unfortunately, with that, we are, we are out of time. This was a wonderful discussion, and I thank the students of the Congressional Youth Leadership Council and both of our, our two panelists today. We had some excellent questions, uh, Mr. Rhodes and Mr. Moffitt. Um, we truly appreciate it. This webcast will be archived on the websites of the Lou Fry Institute at Lou Fry, that's L-O-U-F-R-E-Y dot org, and the U.S. Association of Former Members of Congress at USAFMC dot org. Our next webcast is on Wednesday, November 11th, and we will be focusing on the role committees play in shaping legislation. We hope you all will join us for that, and we again, thank you so much, and goodbye. Yeah.